the Brotherhood of the Thirteen. By the third solar decade of the Great Crusade, the 13th Legion had begun to develop a distinct character of their own. They were recorded as having a practical and forthright mean, with little time given to the esoteric arts of warfare or conjectural strategizing, preferring a direct approach of swift engagement. In warfare, they relied upon the rapid attainment of quickly defined tactical objectives and strategies born of tried and tested battlefield experience and determined by the situation at hand. They also had their pride, and while they were accorded as being unwaveringly loyal to the Imperium's cause, they developed a tendency to guard their honor well and engage in an open rivalry of achievement with the other legions alongside which they served, particularly those few whose Primarchs had already been recovered. The Warrior Brotherhood of the 13th Legion had also begun to display its achievement visually, but rather than take on a particular livery and iconography as a whole as the 3rd Legion, the Emperor's Children, or the 14th Legion at that time still the Dusk Raiders had, individual companies who had come to prominence in a particularly important compliance operation or campaign took on additions to their core Legion livery, which maintained the post-unification storm grey and gun metal they had worn since the Sedna campaign to commemorate their greatest achievements. Those companies who had fought alongside the 8th Legion in the purgation of the ab-human corsairs of the Cancerai Nebula afterwards bore black gauntlets, midnight blue helms, and the ancient Iran weighing scales and death's head icon of judgement in heraldic opposition of their legion numeral, and took the name of Nemesis as their own. Conversely, the principally armoured formations of the 13th Legion, who had halted the orc advance on the ash plains of Sipra Mundi, and in doing so had saved the city of millions from a savage death, afterwards commemorated the battle by mirroring on their right pauldron the emerald light of the blazing armour Borealis that had riven the skies under which they had fought. Such honours were claimed as a legion's strength made visible, but for them no formal name as a whole was desired, save for its number, as their first lord commander, Gren Vesotho, is recorded to have said. Quote, I am told that once the numeral 13 was taken as an ill omen by the weak-minded and those enslaved by the lies of superstition. But, in the Emperor's service, we shall make it a byword for redemption and glory. The sorest test of the 13th Legion's resolve and their arts of war was yet to come, however. By the year 833 M30, the 13th Legion had increased in number to an active force of around 33,000 Space Marines, whose primary battle group now consisted of the autonomous 12th Expeditionary Fleet. This expansion of their number in a relatively short space of time had been due to two principal factors. The first was that their particular practical style of warfare had a tendency to avoid casualties where possible, compared to the tactics employed by certain other legions. The 13th avoided battles of attrition, and prided themselves on achieving strategic goals with the minimum expenditure of life, and where salvageable human worlds were involved. This desire was also extended to the minimization of civilian collateral damage. The second reason was a latterly revealed aspect of their gene seed, 
while the rates of gene seed implantation success for the 13th zygote type were very close to the median level, it had proven to be in the highest resistance band to errors during extensive replication. A meridian matched only by the first legion's own core sample, suffering relatively little mutation or deviation in the subsequent generation of harvested Astartes organs. This allowed the legion to steadily expand its numbers, even without the genetic stabilization brought by the availability of a Primarch's own mature gene code. At this time, the Emperor, in command of the might of the Principia Imperialis Expeditionary Fleet, Pharos Manus and his Tenth Legion and Horrors and his Lunar Wolves respectively, led the three main thrusts of the Great Crusade. They were pushing on into the Outer Void, far beyond the Segmentum Solar. But such was the size, self-sufficiency, and genetic stability of the 13th Legion that the 12th Expeditionary Fleet alone was entrusted with the task of exploring the extent of the inner galactic disk and its densely packed star systems coreward of Terra. This was why when a secession crisis unexpectedly flared up close to the Capitoline systems of the Segmentum itself, the 13th was the closest available and the swiftest to respond. The Osiris Cluster, a grouping of 11 star systems making up the inner portion of the Segmentum Solar's second quadrant, had suddenly and without warning declared secession from the Imperium. Chartist merchant vessels had been seized, Imperialis Armada naval patrol squadrons fired upon and driven off by system defense ships, and agents of Imperial authority rendered silent and assumed dead. The inhabited world of the Osiris Cluster, many technologically advanced at contact, had originally come into compliance during the Great Crusade's eighth standard year in relatively bloodless order. It had been viewed as a highly successful campaign in which the 13th Legion itself had a hand. That the Osiris Cluster had now fallen into open rebellion was deemed an affront to the Legion's honor by its Lord Commander Gren Vasotho, and the Legion Master of the 13th had vowed to bring the matter to a resolution as swiftly and empathetically as possible. The Sotho, acting on initial intelligence reports, ordered the warships of the 12th Expeditionary Fleet to proceed directly to the Halo world of Septus 17, leaving behind the fleet's support elements, lumbering troop transports and forward ships guarded by its slower combat vessels. The target of this rapid strike force was to be the atmospherically sealed city of Cabasse, located on the night side of Septus 17, and the economic and political capital of the Osiris Cluster. A strike there before the rebels had time to consolidate their forces, the Sotho reasoned, might end the rebellion in a single bloody stroke. Breaking into real space in the outer system, the power of the twelve expeditionary fleet's two score of capital warships, led by the Legion's flagship, the Goliath-class macro battleship, Sathalm's Thunder, easily swept aside the system defense monitors and fireships sent out to intercept them. Immediately after the short firefight, in which the Space Marine ships sustain no losses, they engage in a brief and equally successful long-range precision bombardment to defang Septus 13th orbital defenses before moving to attack the planet itself. The Sotho had formulated a plan of attack based around a decapitation assault against the governmental and environmental control complexes 
on which all life in the hive city of Kawase was dependent for survival. The strategy was a variation of a tried and proven tactic in part developed from close observation of the lunar wolves mastery of such attack forms and which promised a quick resolution with the minimum of damage to the hive world's infrastructure and an object lesson in the futility of rebellion against the rule of the emperor. The plan itself was predicated on detailed prior knowledge of the world as an imperial holding and a military assessment of the potential numbers and capabilities of the rebellious militia forces the legion was projected to encounter. Unfortunately, every assumption Vesotho and his command staff had made about what awaited them was wrong. The Attack on Scepter 17 The attack began well enough, with the close support fire of Sathan's thunder opening up great rents in Hive Kabase's protective outer shell into which Vesotho personally led his legion's stormbirds to the attack. Resistance was immediately far heavier than expected as the landing force became swiftly bogged down in human waves made up of at first hundreds and soon thousands of dead-eyed civilians crudely stitched into makeshift pressure suits and armed with improvised weapons of every sort, not least among them explosive mining charges converted to suicide devices. The 13th Legion quickly modified their tactics to inflict maximum attrition, but heedless of casualties, the tide of bodies pressed on in cold silence. It was quickly apparent this was no mere rebellion and no ordinary enemy. Unwilling to allow his attack to be stalled and his invasion force surrounded, Vesotho called down reinforcements and ordered his attacking squads to press on, relying on speed and coordination, as well as the superiority of his space marines in close quarters combat, to carry the battle. Slowly, and with steadily growing losses, the Legiones Astartes forced their way deeper into the Hive City, and one by one began to claim their tactical objectives, crushing better armed but equally vacant minded opposition formed from what had once clearly been the bodyguard cadres of the Hive City's nobility. But once the 13th Legion was heavily committed and kilometers deep into the Hive, the trap was sprung. A Xenos fleet of unknown type and origin comprising five vast hourglass-shaped vessels whose structures turned and rotated ceaselessly like clockworks appeared with great speed from within the fiery corona of Septus's giant star. Realizing the disaster that was about to unfold, Lesotho called a general retreat from the surface, but as his forces battled to return to their gunships and transports, the assault on the space marines intensified as the nature of the attacks began to change. While the waiting storm birds fell under concerted all-out attack in an attempt to cripple or destroy them, fresh mobs of grasping civilians poured from side junctures and corridors, their intention not to kill but to overwhelm and pinion individual legiones astartes, drowning them in their mass of bodies, heedless of the cost of life. Above them in the void, the two fleets clashed. The great hourglass craft, 
each easily outmassing the gargantuan Sathaun's thunder, lashed out with blazing whips of elemental particles, scorching and burning the Imperial warships and engulfing any fighter squadrons or torpedo salvos that came close in collapsing gravitational singularities, annihilating them utterly. The Twelfth Expeditionary Fleet was overmatched, but fought on valiantly, causing one of the titanic Xenos craft to fall back, strangely colored vapors bleeding luminously from its rent hull, but at the cost of a dozen of its own number. While the Sathan's thunder, at that point a burning wreck, tumbled out of control through the line of battle. It was then that fearful figures, aglow from within with sickly light, began to materialize among the attackers, both on the surface and directly onto the warring Imperial vessels. Armored in some form of Baroque biomechanical containment suits, the creatures within were barely corporeal, ghoulish shapes of glowing mists whose gauntlets spat ethereal fire and whose alien wills reached out to crush the minds of those who resisted them. The Sotho's final command was for the fleet to withdraw with as many of the 13th Legion as could be recovered, but withdraw it must. A new enemy of the Imperium had been met, and word of it must reach Terra at any cost. The Sotho committed his life to the command of the rearguard on the surface as penance for his error and his last act was to transfer Legion Command to the most senior surviving commander present in orbit, First Master Marius Gage. It was a testament to Gage's swift thinking and tactical acumen that he was able to hold off the enemy vessels until every surviving stormbird from the ground assault had departed the planet fighting a swirling three-dimensional battle of thrust, counter-thrust, and retreat, which held the enemy Titan ships at bay until the Twelfth Expeditionary Fleet had fought its way clear. Ultimately, what could have been a disaster had been fought into a mere defeat, and when all was afterwards measured, the 13th Legion had suffered a little over 6,500 Space Marines lost, the largest tally of any single battle in the Legion's history. Although this was approximately a fifth of its fighting strength in terms of Astartes, the lost counted among them much of the elite of the Legion many of them Terran veterans from its founding, and its Lord Commander, Gren Vesotho, with them. Its fleet had also suffered heavily, with a quarter of its warships lost or irrevocably damaged, not least of all its flagship. Just as bitter a blow was to Legion's pride and honor, at the defeat to which their overconfidence had led them. They hungered for vengeance, but even this was denied. When the 13th Legion returned to the now quarantined and blockaded Osiren Cluster a little under a standard year later, it was with a force heavily augmented from the Solar Armada, Elements of the 18th Legion, the Salamanders, and specialist anti psycho carders from Terra. Of the enemy Xeno forms, the Officio Biologis had designated Osiren Cybrid. There was no sign. Instead, 
The Imperials found worlds either left as wastelands of the unburied dead or locked in turmoil and civil strife. Piecing together fragmentary records from planetary data spheres and human minds alike, all but purged clean, it was impossible to know from where the Xenos had come or where they had gone. Only, they had operated covertly at first, insidiously claiming worlds outright, burning out the wills of their populations, stealing away some bodily into the void, and leaving the others to simply mindlessly perish by starvation or inaction in their absence. Other worlds they had sent first into rebellion and then strife, through covert psychic domination of their rulers and manipulation of their population's fears. The revelation was of a foe perhaps not numerous, but both insidious and frighteningly powerful. A clear threat now marked for extermination by the Emperor's own writ. In the wake of the short campaign, Empty of glory, which brought the remains of the Osiris Cluster back into the Imperium's control for repopulation, the 13th Legion swore a blood oath of vengeance against the Xenos wherever and whenever they might appear again. The Legion now under Marius Gage's stewardship as the new Lord Commander and Legion Master, reorganized and sought to quickly replenish its numbers and supplies, and afterwards redoubled its effort in the Great Crusade service, as if trying with each fresh victory to prove that the defeat of Septus Twelve had been an aberration, never to be repeated, and the name of its lost master, and indeed the battle in which he fell, became a thing no longer spoken of, but which dwelled as a shadow at their shoulders. There existed within the Legion now a brooding sense of loss, and a canker of doubt in its own abilities, and in the hearts of its legionaries grew the desire, always present, but now lent keen impetus to reunite with their Primarch as a balm to all their ills, to become, as they saw it, whole. The dark irony was that more than two Tehran years previously, unknown and withheld from the legion's knowledge, and before the events at Septus 12, their Primarch had been located by the Emperor. But, owing to the vagaries of the warp, contact would not prove possible for several more standard years. During this period, brief as it was, and yet seeming an eternity to the Sons of the Thirteenth, the Legion fought on with a relentless, but joyless hunger for battle, taking world after world for the Great Crusade in rapid succession, but shunning now both the laurels of victory it once courted and the respect of its peers it once craved, until the hour of its salvation came at last.